Well, hello everyone. It's time for another episode of Global Sports Channel Sports Personality Spotlight. And boy, do I have some serious heavyweight in the house today. She's a world champion. She's an Olympic champion. She's a world record holder and much, 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 much more. But you'll find that out once she joins the show. I want you to just, even if you're in your house, you know no one else is watching, give a big cheer, a big round of applause for my next guest today, which is Delilah Muhammad. Delilah, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. Oh no, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Now you've been busy moving recently. How has that all been going? It's been going good. It was definitely stressful, just that process of moving. But now that I'm here, I'm feeling a lot less stress and I'm just happy to kind of get my training back where it needs to be to get ready for these Olympics, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we'll talk about that. Now, have you moved? Did you move far? Was it a local move or a big move? I did. I moved all the way to Texas from oh. Los Angeles. So it was a, a pretty big move, 1,400 miles exactly. <laughs> right. And the weather's a little different in Texas than LA, right? It is much different. So we're definitely having to like adapt to this colder um, atmosphere, but we're making it work. Love it, love it. Now I'm gonna jump right in because there's so much to you, girl. I just, I just want everyone to to know and learn about your journey. What was it? How did you first get into hurdles? And did you do any other sports before you embarked upon that journey? No, I didn't. I, I, um, I wasn't always a hurdler, but I did learn how to hurdle at a very young age. So. Um, I used to just be a kid in my neighborhood that would run around. I loved to, I always loved to run and I always loved to race and I would be racing all the kids in my neighborhood and my very first coach noticed me outside and honestly probably for about maybe two or three years begged my mother to help me to for me to join the track team. So that's kind of how I got my start and funny enough I actually started in distance so that was definitely uh, different from what I do now. So was your mom kind of against it in the beginning or, you know, why, why he had to take take two years to convince her to let you go for it? I think it's just like all parents. I was very young at the at the time, too. So I started running yeah. when I was seven years old. Um, but I my parents would tell you I ran before I walked. So even at three years old, I was running like everywhere I would go. I like I never walked anywhere. Um, so I think it was just the young, the age that they're like, oh, we're not going to have her going to this track team, you know, right. away right. from home every single day. That just seems like a, such a commitment for a five year old. But at seven, they agreed. Um, wow. So I think that's kind of what it was. Um, yeah. I think, wow, that's a really early start, five, seven. I mean, I think that's probably the youngest I've heard. So you've got a lot of years in the game. How did you eventually steer from distance and probably you tried other events to to just like, okay, hurdling is my thing? You know, I at a young age, my coach, he taught us everything. So at a very young age, I, like I said, I did distance. I learned how to hurdle. I learned the high jump, even the shot put. I even wow. learned how to race walk. So I think he was just trying to figure out what our niche would be. Yeah. Um, I always loved the hurdles, but I really wasn't that good at them. I never really had the that person that had like, or that kid that had perfect form over the hurdles. I just, I just liked the hurdles. I think I always saw it as something as like a way to get better. And I always, I loved that challenge at a young age, like trying to figure out how to become faster in them. Um, yeah. So I think it was just me trying out every single event that kind of, geared me toward hurdles right and then you found the one that gave you the biggest challenge and you're like sign me up <laughs> that's the one i want now the competitive streak that you have is that just you or is that something that your whole family is kind of competitive or is that something in delilah's blood you know what i honestly think it's just me <laughs> i think it's just me like I, don't, I wouldn't say it's like a family trait that i have like you know um right right that you know they like my family, I would say they definitely, you know, if there's a goal or something they're trying to obtain, they're definitely go getters and um, to, um, yeah, to reach their goal and what potential that they're trying to reach in life. But I think I'm probably, probably singled out in just the competitive side. At a, at a young age, I was always very competitive. Um, my sister used to teach me mathematics at a young age. Um, my sister's actually a teacher now. And so she used to teach me, she used, that was like her thing, like, and I, I would cry like if I got one wrong. So I was always like very like had to be like had to have it perfect. Um, right. And that's the type of child that I was. 
Right. So striving for that perfection, which as you can see from your career, as people can see from your career, which they'll learn more about as we get through the show, is a huge element of putting it all together as a 400 meter hurdler. Now, you did compete on the collegiate level at USC, University of Southern California, which I'm very proud about because I went there also. <laughs> so fight on, you know, the Bruins are going crazy right now. <laughs> but your your collegiate career and your career as a professional, very different, right? So your level at, at collegiately was very different from your level at, at world class. What kept you going and confident that you could eventually get on that Olympic elite level stage? You know, um, I'm not even sure exactly what kept me going. I think it's just something in my brain kind of just clicked my senior year in college. Well, at the end of my senior year in college. And it was just kind of like this moment that I had that I kind of realized that I really wanted to run track and field. And I was, I guess, almost, I always, I always felt like I was born to do this and made to do this. And I didn't feel like I reached my full potential. And I didn't feel like it was fair to myself to let my last college race be my last race. Um, so uh, it's so crazy though, going into that, that 2013 season, I really was just like so driven and so focused on making the team and just kind of getting back to the top of the podium. Um, like I did in like my high school years and before college or even sometimes some years during college, but, um, yeah, it just was so driven and just so focused and I, what was pushing me, I think it's just me kind of having to kind of prove something to myself or wanting to feel like um, track was something that was in me to be great in. Right. So you had tasted success as a youngster. So you already knew what it was like. You talked about in an interview that 2012, that was your final year at USC, you went to US Nationals, which would have been the London Olympic Trials. And you were unfortunately eliminated in the first round. Now, you said that that triggered something in you. What what happened going through that as a sportswoman that propelled the next years to come? I think it was just the fact that, see, when I went to the Olympic trials, I knew that I, you kind of, you know your competition, and I knew that I kind of didn't have a chance to make the team, but right. going right. into those Olympic trials, I thought I didn't care. I just looked at it as my last race and this would be the end. Um, and when I was eliminated that first round and knew that like that would be my last track race, it just, the, it was such an uneasy feeling, the one that I wasn't expecting that I really just had to, I really made the moment that that decision instantly that there's no way that that would be my last race. And I would, I, I owe it to myself to to push forward and to, to try again. Um, so yeah, it was just that, I guess the feeling of defeat and feeling like it sh this should not be the way that it ends. Like I said before, I was running since I was seven years old. Um, and for much, of, for much of those years, I was, you know, meddling and making even world youth teams and making world junior teams. So um, I always saw a senior team in my future and I always saw the Olympics in my future. And I needed to to try again for that. Right. It says a lot about trusting your instincts because, <laughs> because who, you know, other people may have doubted you and, and, and you knew in your heart that that was right for you and following that path has, has definitely played off. Now, some athletes will try to stay with their collegiate coaches after they graduate because that's what they're familiar with. Where did you go after college and, and how did you make the decision to and, and on who was going to help you to pursue your career at a professional level? It's a big decision. Yeah. Um, you know, actually, my college, one of my college coaches, Tina Fernandez, is really the one that pushed me to um, train with, I trained with Yolanda Demas um, outside of college for the first year. Um, and she, we, I saw Lashinda, uh, Lashinda Demas training, um, warming up for the 400 hurdles and getting ready for the warm up. And I just like whispered to my coach, like, that's who I want to train with. And she literally was like, well, then go ask her. Like, so my college coaches were really on board with me kind of going elsewhere and seeing where um, I can take my talents and kind of seeing like um, what else I can do. They too felt like I should not be done in the sport. And they 
wherever I was going to go, that they were going to be supportive and, you know, and wish me luck on my journey. Um, during those, my first year, I actually kind of still trained with USC. Um, I did kind of some fall training with USC and, um, and also Yolanda Demas. So it was, it was kind of just a perfect balance. That's kind of how it is at USC though. You know, they're, yeah. you're like family. Once you go there, you're always welcome back. And no matter on what, how they can help you on that journey, big or small. So, so true. There. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And I know Tina as well, and she's amazing. And it, it really kind of illustrates what it means to have good people around you, especially as a sports person. Now you said in the beginning, it was kind of a blend between, you know, kind of weaning your way out of USC and beginning your professional career. Was there a huge difference between the kind of training you were doing at USC and, you know, your, your training in, in, the, in the big girls world? Let me just say, I, I literally said to Yolanda Dimas at practice, I'm like, I promise you, I'm not this bad. So <laughs> that was like one of our, like, like maybe a week into training a month, I was thinking this woman is probably thinking, why did I let this girl come, um, come to track? She's not serious. She can't be serious. I could not finish a workout. So it was a really, really big shock um, to just the training I was doing and what I was used to. Um, I had never, ever seen workouts like that. I had never worked that hard, I don't think, in my life up until that point. And, yeah, so, yes, it was a major, major um, difference. Right. But now, you know, like I've spoken with a lot of athletes, and as we know, the, the coaching relationship is a huge part of your career. You're literally putting somebody else's career in your hands are you you have you moved on coaches now and and what's that relationship and then how did you come together um you know it just kind of worked out i think it, i just I, I mean i can say i got lucky and we just really meshed together well um but yeah it's so important i think as you as i became a professional i started to realize that um and just how important that relationship is i've always been the athlete that was close to the coaches and it's only when I wasn't that I noticed <laughs> such a change in just your performance and all of those other things. So to find a coach now that I'm really, that we just mesh well and we can bounce ideas off of, it really, really makes a difference. I truly love and respect that he kind of respects my, my ideas and my opinions and we just work well together and it, I mean, it, it works, it's worked out so far. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and Boogie was your coach, right? He's your coach now. He was your coach. Boogie in two Lawrence Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, your coach back in 2016, when you were preparing for, for Rio, was that a tough journey? Because this is something that you'd never accomplished before, but now you have a new, you have a newer coach, you have a newer dream. What was that whole process like in the build up to, to Rio? You know, it was just one of those years. It was one of those another years for me where I was just like, it's now or never kind of moments and either I'm going to do it or I'm not. Um, again, if I don't do it, then I'm done kind of feeling um, because I had amazing kind of 13 season and was quiet after that. And 16, I really just kind of wanted to, to, I wanted to make the Olympic team. I truly did. And honestly, I didn't just want to make the Olympic team. I really wanted to win the 400 hurdles and, I don't really know what put that thought in my mind and that year I actually I had went back to my college coach also for like a very short period of time and it was it was going good but even so I was I was something else I was looking for and and wanting more of and I kind of remembered um Boogie from recruiting me in high school and I didn't obviously didn't go to his um college but I remember kind of speaking to him and I knew that and also I knew some of the girls that he had trained currently and in the past so I just kind of went with the leap of faith that it would kind of work out and thankfully it, it really did it paid off um yeah I think we just kind of messed from the beginning and I I can tell that he believed in me and I think that's really kind of made the difference for me and I he's like he never ever showed me any doubt like and it's like, and at that moment in my life, I, I, maybe I was doubtful or maybe I was dreaming this crazy dream and I just needed someone to hop on board. And he was like, I'm going to be that person. 
And right. So, yeah. I love that. So he was that that one piece that you just kind of needed to bring it, bring it all together. Now you did go on to win that year and become an Olympic champion. What was it? What was that feeling when like this dream that you've had basically since you were a kid, now you've been through high school, you've been through college, you've, you know, you've been on the professional circuit and here it is, you finally have fulfilled that dream. What was that moment like? Oh man, I guess it's just crazy. I guess it's maybe, I don't even know if I'm biased or if I'm, I actually, if this is actually true, it just, it does make you feel like you can accomplish anything you really set your mind to. And I, mm -hmm. I guess that was kind of that living proof that I needed, um, even it being me. Um, I think what's so crazy though, I think I was more excited, I think, for my teammates and how they performed than I even was for myself. And I think sometimes um, when you're, like looking at somebody and it's, it's almost more inspiring to you than your, your own self doing it. Um, and I just, I remember thinking like, I can't believe like Brianna won the Olympics and then forgetting that I also was ranked number one in my event. So that's kind of how you just kind of feel at the time. It's like, it's so exciting. It's almost so overwhelming and you have to be focused in that moment that you kind of forget to enjoy it. But now looking back, it's just kind of so crazy to me how that year kind of played out and um, what it's taught me. Right. Then speaking of how things play out in the lead up to a major championship like that, do you ever kind of have to hold back, you know, to kind of reserve your energy throughout the season? Or is it like every race is kind of all out trying to work out your stride pattern and things like that? Um, you know, that year for me was a build up. If I was coming back. I um, The year before my my fastest 400 hurdle race was, I want to say 55 high. Right. So I was coming back. So every race for me that year was a build up. Um, I, you know, I think so. I think every year is different. I think mostly sometimes I would say just in a general sense, I'm not running a hundred percent every single race, you know, as of like me currently, but that year it was definitely a build up. Every race I was trying to kind of work on something, trying to get better um, each step of the way. Right. Now, after an Olympics, obviously, a lot of attention, a lot of media, this, a lot of, you know, interviews and stuff like that. How do you balance all that and still maintain the integrity of what got you to where you were? Because obviously, as you're building, it's, it's different. Right. And so you're able to do things in a particular way. But now you have all this notoriety. How do you keep it balanced so that you can still continue to stay at such a high level? You know, I think... <laughs> Well, for one, I've had a lot of bad years, and I think I've had a lot of bad times. That that up top um, keeps me humble in the sport. Right. Um, I know that you know it's not guaranteed, and um, it's a blessing when you are healthy. Number one, it's a blessing when you're running fast, and it's a blessing to be winning. And it's it's very easy to not forget those things when you kind of kind of have this like up and down, you know, right. kind of. Here. Um, yeah, and I'm never gonna. I don't think I'm ever gonna be the athlete that wins every single race. But um, when I do perform well, so those times that I do perform well, it's such a blessing to me. Right, right. Now, of course, because it is competition, other competitors' names will always kind of come up if they're on your level uh, when you are on the stage. So Sydney, Sydney McLaughlin would be one of those. And in June 2019, in the lead up to World Championships, you guys raced each other and she took the victory on that particular occasion. Does it ever throw you off, you know, when another athlete seems to be sort of pulling ahead in, you know, in the lead up to such an important year for you? Um, no, it doesn't. I don't think. I think, you know, it's not the first time I've ever gotten beaten, I think, you know. Um, right. and it happens every single season. There, there's somebody or um, that comes along, and I think you know, you know, every competitor is different, and every competitor has their strengths, and everyone's gonna have their day. Um, I think for me, I've always tried to look at it like, okay, what did I do that prevented me from winning, or what did, what could I do better? And that's kind of how I look at every race. It, I think that's for the media, honestly, to to to. <laughs> stir up stories and to <laughs> but I think the best you can do as an athlete is just not even pay attention to it and stay focused on like what you're trying to do um and don't buy into the hype right right so give you the ability to kind of keep that 
calm focus on what you have to do exactly i love that you talk about that because one of the things that we want to do is kind of give the up-and-coming athletes you know some inspiration and some focus and, and what kind of things they should be thinking about when they're going into competition now when you're in a race and things are moving and things are changing you may be far ahead then suddenly someone's coming up on your inside and you can feel the presence do you still stay so composed or is there a moment a trigger in your head like i got i gotta get out of here i gotta, I gotta go i mean i definitely have those races where you know even i think it was the two, 2019 um in des moines um the make trying to make it the world team to Doha. Um, it was definitely one of those moments where it was, I, 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 I think I hit like a wrong step or not this leg came up that I wanted to come up. And it was just one of those, like, you know, those moments that you have in races where you almost panic, but you, instead of like, for me, it's like, don't panic and fall apart, panic and d don't think about it. Keep moving forward. So I definitely have, I've had those moments in races. Um, I think for me, though, it's the opposite. It's when I'm behind that I'm like, you have to catch up. <laughs> right, right. Now, in, in the U.S. Nationals, same year, 2019, you broke the world record. You, were be you became the fastest woman to ever run the event since it was introduced to sport in 1971. And I watched the race, and, girl, you, it looked like it was so easy. Did it feel like it looked no. <laughs> um, what was know, that like? You know, it was exciting. I think I was, I don't know, I was in a weird, not a weird headspace, I would say, but I I guess I, I was feeling like I had the potential to break the record and I knew it would be a good time to do it because obviously it's, you know what it's like, well, in America, trying to make a team is just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so we run fast championship time and we some of us even run better than we do you know than at worlds just to make the team so i knew it'd be a fast race and i knew it'd be an opportunity for me to really push the limits and see what i can do so um during the race i think you you always kind of black out but um about 200 meters into the race i think it was just it was going as that like perfectly, it was going perfectly. Shamir Little had really pushed the pace to begin with and I can feed off her and I, so she pushed me to kind of run the 200. Like it was almost like a, a perfect kind of setup for that race and um, so maybe not until the eighth hurdle and that's kind of where I talked about before where I kind of, I wanted to go over my right leg but my left leg came up and I was trying to push it to 15 steps to eight but I only managed to do seven. So at that moment it kind of all, you know, what I was told or what I was trying to do just kind of went out the, um, went out and I, you know, just kept running, you know, as fast as I possibly could to, you know, finish it. It definitely, I was tying up at the end for sure. Um, but I, I mean, it was a good race. I can't complain at all. <laughs> no, definitely. We're not complaining either. And then to top it all off, you go to worlds, you win and you break the world record again <laughs> were you surprised by that did you think that you would be able to break it again in such a short space of time you know i wasn't really focused on trying to break it so it was just like if it happens great if it doesn't okay like let's focus on winning the race um i definitely knew that the potential was there i think what was the doubt in me not so much um what i can do or even what sydney was capable of but just um just the 400 meter men before us their time wasn't like what kind of they wanted to also break the record and i think them not doing it kind of made me think there's no way that i'm even going to be close to it this time around um um but even sal ran an amazing race so i was just kind of 50 50 with it like maybe it'll happen maybe it won't <laughs> right now the, one of the things that makes you so great as a hurdler is your technique so i want to kind of talk about the technical side because i mean your your technique is striking the way you're able to come down off those hurdles and and execute your stride pattern like you said and i i could tell that you it, on most occasions are, are you know attempting the 15s to 8s and 16s home if i'm not mistaken how hard is getting the technical aspects of the race right and how intense is the training because I, I remember having these kinds of conversations and people not realizing how fast you have to go in practice to kind of simulate what's going to happen in a race talk about the technical end uh, you know i 
Like I said, when I was younger, I was not like an a good hurdler by any means. And I don't think I was actually a good hurdler until I left college, to be honest. Or even in college, I think my college coach really taught me how to hurdle, but it didn't really click even then um, until I was out of college. So it's so crazy to me that people always kind of comment on my form now. It's just like, I still feel like that girl that can't hurdle. Um, but I, I think it's just something I've really, really worked on. Um, mm so much over these years and my coach now is just a stickler for form and technique we do a, a thousand drills a day for a hurdle form um and he it's not good enough until it's perfect for him so um that's just something i really been training i think at this point i, I you know it's kind of second nature but when i have to like coach other form to hurdlers when i'm trying to explain it to them it's like when it kind of brings me back to that this is this is what you're doing is difficult and how can we break it down for them? So then that's kind of when I notice um, and try to get it through to them, how quick, like you said, you have to be to really hit 15 steps and how in the 400 hurdles, you really have to go for it. It's not, a, it's not something where it's just like, okay, you can kind of run slow through it. It's like what people would think. And it's like, no, you have to go for it and work on the fitness side, you know, outside of the hurdles. Right. And trust me, I understand <laughs> because that same stride pattern I attempted many times, but most of the time it ended up as 17s home, not 16s or 19s or whatever was going on at the time. So I can appreciate the effort that has to go into that. Now, speaking of technique, it doesn't always go well, right? It doesn't always work out. And I know I'm, I heard you mention in one interview that you were sprinting and you fell which led to a concussion. How do injuries affect your training? How does it affect your mental game and your confidence? I mean, injuries are always difficult. I think at this, it can really take you out of your mental zone that you're in. And that's so unfortunate. I think for me now, though, I'm kind of that person that's like, I'm going to get injured at some point in the season. And when it happens, just forget, like, act, almost act like, do what you need to do, but act as if it didn't happen and just stay mm -hmm. focused on what you're trying to do. Um, that time that I had got the concussion was, I want to say about two weeks before um, the trials for Doha. Oh gosh. Um, so, yeah, it was just one of those moments where I'm like, I'm going through the concussion protocol, but I'm also having to stay focused and kind of forget that I just had a concussion so that I'm not taken out. Because the mental aspect of running, as you know, is just so, so important. And any little thing can kind of just take you out of that and you'll perform really not to your ability. So I really just try to kind of let those things go. Right. Perfect. And, and and as you mentioned, the mental aspect of sport is is huge. Do you have a, a protocol or a process that you do to do you incorporate things like visualization or positive self-talk? How do you keep yourself in that right space to perform, like you said, at your best so you can take advantage of all the talent you have? Yeah, I definitely do the visuals. Uh, well, I'll do the visuals, but I think I do the self-talk too. I always really focus on um, positive aspect or what could go right in this race. And really just anytime I have a, a negative thought, I always try to rewrite it in my head and make it something positive. Um, and just kind of stay in that headspace. Also, I just don't think about the race. I think, you know, I think about it at practice, but when it's time to actually race, um, I'm thinking about other stuff I, where we have like a real relaxed um, training zone and we bring that to the meets. And so I'm just trying to stay as relaxed as possible. And I'm maybe think, talking about something that has absolutely nothing to do with track. And that works for me. <laughs> I love that because I was talking to another athlete, you know, talking about how some athletes are super hyper, you know, you see the sprinters bouncing around, headphones, <laughs> and us hurdlers and distance runners are all zen out. We're like, no, we need every ounce of our energy. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> I saw on social media, obviously you're training, you're getting ready for the next games, whenever they may be. Uh, looks like they're going to be in July if all goes according to plan. How mm. has covid affected your process what kind of adjustments and interruptions have been a part of your process now and what have you had to do to try and adapt to this unknown that we have now yeah well i'm in texas because of covid um so that's a huge adapt um adaption that i've had to make um we basically i want to say 
the last, you know, we kind of got kicked off our track literally um, around, I don't say March of 2020. Right. So it was just so up until then, I've been running on grass fields and just pretty much at a in a park. Um, and we kind of finally made the decision when it didn't look like we were going to be able to get back on our track that either we had to go do a training camp somewhere or we really needed to just relocate to a state um, that allowed you to train on tracks. Um, and so that's kind of what we did. We kind of just made the decision to just relocate for this year and kind of see how it goes. And maybe we'll be back in LA at some point, but right now Texas is home. Right. And does the training ha has the training had to change because now there's this long period without competition or do you kind of just keep the, the blocks the same fall spring competition? For us, we changed it. I saw a lot of people really performing well over, um, this kind of crazy year but for us we really just kind of went back to just building that base and just kind of staying at so not getting really race sharp we did race a couple of times just kind of see i guess where we're at almost like a, a time trial that you would do at practice but nothing that intensity definitely wasn't there so we haven't raced in a really long time other than you know things that we've done in trainings as like time trials or things like that um and i think that's been the best thing for me i think Especially just being older in the sport, you your body sometimes needs time to just kind of take away. Um, and I've been and I've used COVID to kind of do that. So base training, I'm still working, doing crazy hard workouts, but not at the intensity level that you know you would see in a person that can run 52 seconds. Right, you know? <laughs> right. Of course. Now nutrition is huge for any athlete. The body is performing at such a high level. How do you handle the nutritional side? them to make sure that you get everything that you need are you do you guys have uh, nutritionists or is it are you kind of on your own because i know i've had both worlds where i was trying to figure everything out on my own and then the other side where we had nutritionists that would help us how's that process for you i do work with a nutritionist now and i think during um going into this season i noticed that i needed to make some changes and i don't i didn't think i was really making the right decisions for my body anymore um, so back in the day, like when I was first getting into starting my professional career, I did use, I did use a nutritionist and I think after a while I just kind of figured out like what works for my body and I loved that and I just went with that. It worked for me and just kind of recently I've just been, I don't know, maybe I'm trying to find like that next step or that next goal, but so I'm back with the nutritionist and it's been going good. I think, um, it's just a nice kind of refresher course, um, we don't always know as much as we think we know and just kind of just being humble about it and asking for help when you needed it. Um, so yeah, I'm back with a nutritionist. That's good. I, I think, like you said, we get so used to what we're used to. We don't even realize that sometimes we need to do something differently to take it to the next level. Now you are a Muslim, as you've talked about. What are some of the challenges with competing at such a high level and then still being able to observe your pra and practice your faith the way that you want to? <laughs> I know you spoke about Ramadan before, and I was actually thinking that as well, because I'm training, and I'm like, oh gosh, how's this going to work? You know, I never really um, fast often because right. of track builds, and I think, you know, well, during COVID, actually, I was able to because I didn't have to get ready for any races, so I just wanted to make that commitment to myself to really do that, um, and that was extremely difficult, I would say. I think, for me, one of the most difficult parts was being drug tested or, you know, you're not drinking water. So it's very difficult to have to go to the bathroom. Right. Um, I think it was like little things like that, that I never actually thought about, um, but being Muslim, but you know, I think those are kind of just small things that, you know, that are, I guess, part of being a Muslim, but not what a Muslim is. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't guess I don't really see too many difficulties with being a Muslim. I think, you know, I get asked a lot if I get negative feedback and the truth of the matter is I really don't. Um, there have definitely been moments in interviews where someone will ask me something crazy or, you know, say something, <laughs> <laughs> but, or just their lack of knowledge of a Muslim, I think is where that all stems from. Um, but for the most part, especially when it relates to the fans and just the people that watch the sport, it's been all nothing but good, positive things. Awesome. I love that. Now, this is a bit of a random question, but I know I've thought about it. So I wanted to know if you've thought about it. 
I noticed that you have lots of different hairstyles. You'll wear it long, you'll wear it short. Does how you wear your hair, is it part of the process of preparing for the season or for a race? Like, do you think about that stuff going into the season? I, I mean, <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I think I've always used that kind of thing. Like, if you look good, you, you feel good, you run fast kind of ideas. Right. Like, it, yes, inner, but that outer how you feel outer and outerly definitely helps and with your performance and I guess it's just kind of what I'm feeling in the moment um I know people always like well I have very long hair the day I broke the world record in Des Moines <laughs> and I guess for me it was it was that thing like I always love long hair a lot more so I'm gonna go with that that makes me feel at my best so let's right. go with it see where it goes um and at the you know the next time I did it was completely the opposite but um, even that, it was kind of because of the weather. I knew it would be ridiculously hot there, and I didn't want my hair sticking to my shoulders. So <laughs> right, that's very practical much, reason. That's literally it. That was all the thought process behind that. Um, right, I love it. <laughs> it was. Now, it was like so muggy. <laughs> I love that. That definitely. I mean, I've thought about just taking it all off at times because because the same reason. It's like, oh, I don't want to drag this around. But then, like you said, the confidence. Like I feel good when the hair is good. So, now tell me what has what has it been like since you've gotten all these accolades? How's your life changed since you've become an Olympic champion, a world champion, a world record holder? I mean, a legend, literally in the sport. Um. Well, I've definitely have gotten. I guess things that or blessings that have come my way because of those um those accolades and um that's just opportunities i should say opportunities have definitely come my way because of that which i'm eternally grateful grateful for um but you know i guess just my day-to-day -day life hasn't really changed too much um yeah i don't think it's really changed too much i think i definitely get a lot more notoriety and definitely appreciative of that um i do like that aspect of it um definitely going home too when i go home to New York and um, just kind of seeing the people that live there, um, they all recognize me. They always, you know, they're always there to say hello. So that's that. Those little things like that are really nice. Now speaking of day to day, is the pers personality <laughs> of Delilah as a competitor on the track similar to the at home, every day? Are you quite competitive just in your everyday life? Is that a similar? You know what? I don't think so. I think you have to ask somebody that's in my life. <laughs> I, I don't think so. And then I like my teammates. I said that one day. They all like gave me that look like, are you serious? But <laughs> I mean, I personally don't think so. But I think that's, I don't know. I, would, I do feel differently on the track than I do in my day-to-day -day life. Right. I will say, I think at some point, um, I, I had to kind of consciously make that um difference become um between who i am on the track and who i am in life and as a person and um because sometimes you i don't, I don't say vicious that's a, a you know an extreme word to use but that that competitive side that you need on the track doesn't always work in everyday life and you need to be able to make that differentiate between those type of those two so um i don't think so but i like i said you might need to ask <laughs> so that's <laughs> In my life and see how they feel about it right right now when you're not competing or training or thinking about competing or thinking about training what do you do what do you love to do yeah what do i love to do um you know <laughs> it's so funny because so much of my life has been about track and field and i think right. anything that i so i'm like what do i do when i really am just home or like i'm running errands i'm going shopping i like I do love to shop, so I think that's kind of honestly the honest answer. But right. any kind of outdoorsy, I do enjoy. I love that. Now, if you were mentoring a young up and coming athlete, what would you tell them that sports has taught you? And what advice would you give them if they, you know, were aspiring to be like you someday? Oh, um, you know, I guess one thing I think has the sport has really told me that anything is possible and we can really, um, when you truly kind of believe in like what you're doing and you push it to your, the almost as much as you can give, you'll, you'll, you'll get it back. Um, and I truly do believe that, that those things is possible. That's kind of how it's felt for me when you give that equal, if you want something, you have to put in that equal effort to get it and you'll get it back. Um, 
So I think that's one. I think just the belief part, though, I think that's something that I struggled with. It's hard to tell someone to believe in their self. But just it's but you start to realize how how easy it is to not believe in yourself and how easy it is to let those doubts kind of come into play. And I see it so much in young athletes and um, just kind of have that belief and that courage and that just be courageous about like what you're doing and do things with a purpose. Um, it's kind of I, my advice, I guess I'd give to younger girls and younger guys, too, of course, just moving, move with purpose, be courageous and just have that self-belief. I love it. Now, speaking of youngsters and, and yourself, this era is completely different from the past with social media, Instagram and everything. How does that play into your career? Is it ever a distraction? And how do you handle that um, as you go into major championships and competition season? I mean, it certainly can be a distraction. I think um, with social media nowadays, you can definitely see what everyone thinks about you and good or bad so um you just really have to let not let it get to you or honestly don't read it if you are the type of person and we all are human at the end of the day so it's only so much you can take um without it affecting you so i think that's the kind of the unfortunate side of it it truly can be a blessing too because now um you're getting noticed more there's definitely that factor of it that i do love and um you can there are brands that i even like that i you can just speak to directly you know things like that, that definitely, that people didn't have back in the day was no, um, hey, if I wanted to, I can just reach out to Pepsi, like, hey, Pepsi, again, you know, <laughs> you have those type of things that, you know, that you didn't have before. So I think it's, it's great in that aspect of it, but it definitely can be just as negative. So um, but I like, but like anything in life, I think you need to just, you take the bad with the good and you try to just focus on only the good and ignore the rest. I like that. Now you've checked all the boxes athletically. Let's 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 be honest here, right? What are your athletics goals now for the future? Well, you know, I definitely still want to compete really well. I still want to do well. I still want to be on top. Um, you know, I, it hasn't changed for me. I think um, there's still more. I think that could be done in the 400 hurdles that I can possibly do, and that's really really great. I think. You know, honestly, also, it's it's hard. I guess the competitive side of me it says it's hard to kind of let it go, you know. Um, but also, I really do enjoy just watching my teammates or even younger athletes perform well. And I think more so now than I ever have before. And it's not that I didn't before, but now, you know, I think, you know, to see someone else's success brings me just as much joy. So um, I love to kind of be that person that can help them along the way because you learn so much about the 400 hurdles. I've learned so much about track in general. It's like this, I guess the knowledge that you gained is like, you have to pass it on. Like you just, right. you must. So that's kind of how I feel about it now. It's just, I, I'm, you know, maybe in a couple of years, my time will be up, but that knowledge will kickstart your career. I love it. Now, in general, in terms of life, if I was to interview in 10 years time, what would you want to be able to say has happened in that time? Oh, man, 10 years from now. She's like, I'll be on the beach sipping a martini. <laughs> um, no, hopefully I would like to be married. I'd like to have children in 10 years from now. Certainly, I think that's um, 10 years. I'll certainly be done with track and say that with, you know, <laughs> complete certainty um so yeah i think family life i think that's kind of where i would see my um life and i'd still like to be um somewhere um in like work wise somewhat related to track but not exactly on the obviously not on the running side but somewhere still in the track world right now, one thing that you said in an interview that I thought was so profound and maybe other people might have glossed over it, but you said that track and field was greater than you. What did you mean by that? <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, you said as you were coming up as a youngster that, you know, and, and coming through and growing and the reason, part of the reason why you wanted to keep continuing is, um, as an athlete, no matter what ups and downs you were going through, is that you just felt that there was something about it that was greater than you and that was driving you to pursue. So tell me more about that feeling. Uh, I think, okay. Yeah, I guess I always felt 
you I think in anything you do in life and you kind of feel like you've kind of found your purpose in life and I think that's for me at a young age that's almost I wouldn't have used that word at a young age but that's kind of what I felt like um like I was on the right path um that I guess yeah God was like I was just a vessel and God was using me for a bigger cause Mm -hmm. um and that's really kind of what that kind of notion that I couldn't explain as a child, but that kind of idea, it just kind of pushed me to keep moving forward in the sport. Um, and I, I was kind of slowly progressing each year and I was just slowly getting better. Um, it just like, it was almost like it was just enough to keep me going, but not enough to say I'm done. Like sometimes you, you see, you, you reach success at a young age and it's like, what comes next kind of feeling and for me it was it was never like that it was such it was such a steady pace that it kind of just kind of always kind of brought me back and so that's kind of how I felt as a child and I didn't understand like what that was or how to explain that so when I said it was just greater than myself I like I literally felt like what I mean by that it was just like I felt like a vessel like a greater power was using me for for a bigger cause and I needed to allow that to I guess feed into it believe it and go with it I love that you know I, I, that's something that I really want audience members especially if they are up and comings or sports people to really learn from your story because so many times if it doesn't look perfect or if it's not exactly what people think it should be they will you know give negativity or say, no, 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 you should leave that alone. But if something in your heart is saying to keep pursuing that, I think it's important to at least explore that. Absolutely. Now, Delilah, I have a little game I want to play with you. I play with all my guests, right? It's called This or That. You're just going to pick one or the other, all right? (laughs) So I think I know the answer to the first one. So we'll get that one out of the way. Short hair or long hair? long <laughs> olympic long. medal olympic medal or world record <sighs> world record android or iphone iphone <laughs> <laughs> heels or spikes Ooh, hills <laughs> <laughs> me too so you good all right wonderful it's been amazing talking to you catching up with you one last question delilah what do you want the world to know what do I want the world to know? You guys, these questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going deep there. I'm doing an Oprah about Winfrey me on me. Or what? <laughs> you know, just about life or aspirations that they may have. Oh, man. I guess I want people to believe and dream in big, to have crazy dreams and see them through. It's so possible. Um, I definitely feel like living proof of proof of that I've had crazy years where I just had sparks of inspiration so things that are so small and from those little sparks of inspiration amazing things have truly happened and I I guess I really want people to know that that's possible in anything that you want to do in life absolutely and I just want to make sure people really hear that message that Delilah is speaking about right now, that it is so important. If you have the inspiration, if you believe in yourself, that absolutely anything is possible. Delilah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. I know there's a hundred thousand things you could probably be doing to get ready for the games, but you took the time to be with us. If people want to follow you or you know check on your career or or be or find out what you're up to on on online or wherever how can they get a hold of you how can they follow you i'm just on instagram actually so no twitter i know people always think i have twitter i do not have twitter just dalila muhammad instagram awesome all right well good luck we are rooting for you we i've got all my excitement my my trojan alumni is going to be going after that gold in tokyo so we wish you all the best and just good luck (laughs) thank you you're welcome thank you so much bye-bye a legend
in track and field. I mean, seriously, Olympics, world championships, world record. Not only did she break the world record, she did it twice in one year. Hello. I mean, what an amazing athlete. And she's completely humble, completely cool, calm and collected. But when she gets out there on that track, it's forget it. Now, what she said for people that are aspiring to you know their own dreams and maybe it doesn't always look the way it should maybe it doesn't look like okay that it's something you know there are some athletes that when they start out it's like oh yeah this is definitely gonna and she didn't have that necessarily going through her collegiate career as a as a youngster as a high school she had success but it was a little bit different going through her collegiate career but she held on to her dream she held on to her instinct that she could be great right so i want you guys to take that from take that message from that that it doesn't matter what other people say it doesn't even matter what's on paper if your heart is telling you that that's something that you should pursue it's definitely something that you need to pursue and exhaust all your options until you see your success now I hope you enjoyed that as much as i did uh just love talking to legends of course and if you did i want to make sure you like follow, share, and comment on your favorite moment. Was there something she said that really, really, really just kind of ticked the box for you? We like to engage with you, so definitely let us know how you feel about that. All right, well, as usual, until next time, ciao for now.